just go to the Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining our 31st special dialogue hosted by Global Health Innovation Policy Program at GRIPS. Um, my name is Hiromi Murakami, and I'm privileged to be facilitating and organizing this dialogue series. And we initiated this dialogue series back in 2020 in response to challenges posed uh, by COVID-19, but now we have uh, extended or broadened our scope of our dialogue addressing uh, health crisis, regional... Um, I know this is already, yeah, it's already. So security threats and economic and political disruptions and focusing on Japan's challenge. Today, we're very excited to welcome an expert on health and climate change, Dr. Eileen Naduzi of Georgetown University, and she will be sharing her views on health and climate, lessons and challenges from the Pacific Island, what Japan and the US can do. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, as Japan often suffers from natural disasters. It is a great opportunity today that Dr. Eileen to share with us her experience in Pacific Islands. We extend our gratitude to the U.S. Embassy Tokyo for funding this project, Japan's Challenge Dialogue Series. We very much appreciate your support. And we have Q&A box uh, on the bottom. So please feel free to post your questions and we pick up your questions at the end of this, uh, after Dr. Natsuzi's talk at the Q&A sessions. So our commentator today is uh, GHIPP Director, Dr. Kiyoshi Kurokawa, who has been engaging in this realm of global health and health policy in here. Uh, Dr. Kuroka is not only passionate leader, uh, but has also chaired numerous institutions, including Science Council of Japan and the Diet Investigation Committee for Fukushima Nuclear Power Plant Incident, and etc. Let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Eileen Natsuzi, who has worked on health capacity building in Solomon Islands for 18 years. She received her medical degree from George Washington University, did her surgical training at the University of California, San Francisco, and obtained her master's in public health and epidemiology from San Diego State University. She currently serves as the Solomon Islands co-coordinator for Australia, New Zealand, Gastrointestinal International Training Association, ANZI is that the right Anzi Gita. Anzi Gita. And it is a visiting staff member, member at the National Hospital. Referral Hospital, NRH, in Honiala, Guadalcanal. The ANZI Gita, program along with the doctors and nurses at NRH established the first endoscopy service for the country which is now defining the prevalence and epidemiology of gastrointestinal disease in the people Solomon Islands suffers from. Mm -hmm. Dr. Natsuzi's main focus is on the health impact from climate change, in particular extreme weather events in urban Pacific Island environments. She actively advocates for health system infrastructure development aid as a means to reduce risks and harms from extreme weather events. Dr. Natsuzi has published a number of papers on health and climate change in Solomon Islands, as well as editorial on issues pertinent to geopolitical events in the Hill, the Diplomat, the Policy, Griffith University's Pacific Outlook, and Global Health Governance, in addition to publishing in medical journals. With that, and now I pass the micro microphone to Dr. Eileen and Natsuzi for her remarks, please. Thank you very much, uh, Konnichiwa. Um, I am honored to be here uh, and to be able to talk to you about this particular topic. Um, I do want to just sort of introduce myself uh, to you. Uh, I am a retired a uh, general vascular and trauma surgeon, uh, worked for 30 years uh, in San Diego. And during that time, uh, almost 20 years uh, traveling back and forth to the Solomon Islands. Um, when I retired uh, and the geopolitical uh, situation kind of changed uh, in the 
Pacific and particular Solomon Islands, uh, Alan Tidwell, who is uh, the director of the Center for Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies, uh, asked me to get involved and talk about health as diplomacy. So I'm a bit of a uh, square peg in a round hole doing uh, foreign service, uh, the, working with the School of Foreign Service, uh, but it gives me a, a, a platform to be able to address groups like you uh, about issues that are important for building strong health systems in the Pacific Islands. Um, I just want to make sure you can all hear me and see the screen. Thank you. Looks good. Okay. All right. With that, um, let me start uh, my presentation. Um, I live in San Diego, California, when I'm not working in the Western Pacific. And San Diego is essentially a desert climate. It's a coastal desert climate. Our annual rainfall is less than 30 centimeters a year. Um, but our weather is changing. And in August of 2023, we had a tropical storm Hillary make landfall uh, in the Southern California. It's the first time since 1939 we have ever, we have seen a tropical storm. Uh, in January, this past January, we had 6.9 centimeters of rain in one hour, uh, and it caused massive flooding, a lot of property damage, and people who needed to be rescued. So again, evidence that our um, climate is changing, even in a uh, uh, dry, dry area like San Diego. Um, I could spend this time talking to you about the impacts um, of our changing climate on our health, the direct impacts. And certainly we know that um, after a natural disaster, extreme weather event, there can be immediate injuries and deaths. There can be disruption to our regular healthcare systems. There could be infectious disease outbreaks from standing water, and particularly from um, uh, vector-borne diseases. There are impacts on food supplies, whether it's a drought, whether it's a flood, um, whether there's unclean water, mental health impacts, and then delayed health impacts from people having difficulty accessing the health system. But that's not what I wanna to talk to you about today because I think that you hear about those things. What I wanna to talk to you about today is something that's a bit more obscure. Today, I wanna to talk to you about hospitals. And I wanna to talk to you about hospitals that become victims of extreme weather events, just like people do. Um, and I think that uh, some of our examples uh, for you here in Japan and for me in the United States, those of us in the United States, kind of set the stage for understanding that even some of the best constructed hospitals can be damaged by extreme weather events and impact how our healthcare is delivered. The earthquake and tsunami in the northeast coast of uh, Japan that occurred in 2011 damaged nine hospitals. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like the information that I've gotten is damaged nine hospitals. That clearly impacted the ability to deliver care to people in that region of your country. Hurricane Tr Katrina in 2005 made landfall in New Orleans in the United States. It flooded the entire New Orleans city area because the levees failed and the pump system didn't work. And I think the best known example of a hospital problem in New Orleans was Charity Hospital. Uh, that's the picture in the middle uh, here. Charity Hospital was flooded and there were operational difficulties that resulted in essentially what were avoidable deaths. The third example is when Superstorm Sandy landed in New York City in 2012. It flooded the lower portion of Manhattan and the New York University Langoon Medical Center had the two lower levels flooded. It's an 18 story building and on the top of the hospital was where the alternative energy source was located. The problem is the circuits that distributed the electricity and the fuel for the the emergency energy um, uh, generators were located on the lower levels. So they were involved in the flooding. 
Without power, patients were evacuated down 18 stories through the stairwells um, by hand. One of the key points that I want to make about these three examples of hospitals here in Japan and in the United States is we did well because our health system has redundancy. We have multiple hospitals uh, in relatively close proximity to each other. And what we don't have in the Pacific Islands is redundancy. So what do we do about a hospital like St. Joseph's Hospital located on Hunafula, or Funafala, excuse me, in Tokelau? What happens when this hospital is destroyed? When the 70% of the people in the country who rely on this hospital for their medical care lose that? Um, and this atoll is located hundreds of miles away from another hospital. That community waits for emergency services to come and help them. So this talk is going to be mainly talking about how can we prevent Pacific Island countries from losing hospitals. This is a picture of Haniara from 2014 when I was working at the National Referral Hospital. And during it, while we were working there, we had three meters of rainfall in three days. The, this was due to a tropical storm being stalled off the um, uh, southern uh, coast of Guadalcanal. And the Matanica River, which is seen in this picture, um, which runs through the center of Haniara, the capital city of, of uh, Solomon Islands, became a muddy torrent ripping through villages adjacent to the river. Um, storm surge damaged the some of the hospital's uh, buildings, including the pediatric ward and the labor and delivery ward, and th that required evacuating patients. Numerous clinics throughout Haniara were damaged during the flooding, and about approximately 30 people, estimated 30 people, were killed, uh, and they were mainly women and children who were in their villages uh, at the time that the river broke its banks. An evaluation of the vulnerability of the um, health system in Haniara uh, was done shortly after the flood occurred. And what we found is 75% of the capital city's health systems, including the hospital, as well as the clinics, as well as the Ministry of Health, as well as the medical supply store, uh, were vulnerable to further hydrologic events based on buffer measurements that you can see in this picture. So we know that the Pacific Island is at high risk. They've been high risk because of the types of extreme weather events that they've been subject to uh, in the past throughout their history. Um, that's going to increase in intensity and in frequency. And in 2021, the World um, Risk Report assessment ranked five Pacific Island countries among the 15 most vulnerable countries to extreme weather events and natural disasters. And usually this measurement is calculated by looking at exposure to events, so flooding, uh, cyclones, uh, et cetera. Uh, how susceptible is the infrastructure uh, to damage? What's the coping capacity of the country, including their health system as well as uh, social services? And what kind of adaptive capacity do they have for preventing the preventing problems and, and uh, minimizing future shocks? On the right side of this um, slide is information from the 2016 World Risk Report where they coined the phrase critical infrastructure. And critical infrastructure includes everything listed in the, this table on the right with that nice big fat red arrow pointing out health because health and, and it, the buildings within which health is delivered are as important as roads, bridges, airports to keep functional and make strong so that they can stand up to virtually any uh, extreme weather event that's thrown at them. So 
why care about health system infrastructure in the Pacific Islands? Well, I think the main reason is extreme weather events, which are increasing in frequency, increasing in intensity in the region, but have been endemic to the region all along, uh, result in taxing already under-resourced health systems by causing increases in the rates of infectious diseases, worsening of existing chronic diseases, and increased incidence of acute injuries. Key point, when, da when damaged, the ability to deliver care decreases. You know this in Japan. There was actually a very interesting study that I read recently about how um, the number of prescriptions increase uh, during a, a heat wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and that suggests that the health system is being taxed and utilized uh, more. Um, but I think the other really, really key point that I alluded to when we talked about hospitals in, in Japan and in the United States is hospitals in Pacific Island locations are isolated uh, and they lack that the, the uh, benefit of redundancy of care options. Um, ships have to arrive to assist them. And so that these three reasons I think are really important for us in particular as we work on policy and we promote climate change uh, measures um, to keep those in mind. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a data head in that the only way to push policy and change the way we approach things is to generate data that shows why we should do that. And basically I work with a group and we asked ourselves a question with frequent extreme weather events, how vulnerable are remote hospitals located throughout the Pacific Islands? How can we show some numbers to support our asking for um, adaptation to address hospitals. What we needed to know was how many hospitals were at risk, and more importantly, how many people would be adversely impacted if a hospital is damaged. And this is a slide um, that shows some of the data that we collected using GIS uh, technology. We measured the distance from the hospital to a hydrologic threat, so coastline or river. Uh, and we measured the um, and estimated the level above sea level that the hospital was located in. And then we kind of structured out who was most, which hospitals were most vulnerable, which were least vulnerable, kind of stratified them. Essentially, we looked at 76 hospitals in 14 Pacific Island countries and found 58% of those hospitals were located within less than 300 meters of a hydrologic threat, putting them at risk for damage depending upon heavy precipitation, cyclones, et cetera. We, map, we, we looked at the basically the percentage of people that would be impacted by losing their hospitals and found region-wide, 63% of Pacific Island, the Pacific Island population would be at risk for losing their mm -hmm. hospital and losing care. And I just want to show you some examples of Pacific Island hospitals. This is the original uh, Nui uh, Hospital. Uh, it was built in 1960s. Uh, it's located 84 meters from the coastline uh, it's at 27 meters uh, elevation on a cliff, a set of cliffs that have been rapidly eroding over time. Uh, in the 1990s, this hospital was destroyed by a cyclone, and it was rebuilt in the same vulnerable location at a cost of $2 million U.S. dollars. In 2004, it was destroyed again by Hurricane uh, Hedda, uh, or Cyclone Hedda, excuse me. Um, this time, it was relocated. The key with this hospital, and so this is a, an aerial view uh, of the old hospital in blue, uh, and the hospital marked in red is the relocated hospital. The key with this particular hospital is it took two years to build this new hospital. And during that time, the population of Nui, which has only one hospital, um, received all of its care in um, uh, temporary hospital tents or surge tents. Uh, 
until the new hospital opened. And so this is the new Ifu um, hospital uh, that cost $23 million to build. I do wanna make one point. When a hospital is completely destroyed, the cost to, re to move it and rebuild it goes up significantly as opposed to electively choosing to relocate the hospital. I think that in Inui, they were fortunate that they could go inland and up, um, but not every Pacific Island country can do that. And this is an atoll country. This is uh, Tokelau. This is Nukununu uh, National Hospital. Uh, and it has serves their population of approximately 452 people. Uh, it's 12 meters from the coastline, elevation eight meters. There's nowhere to go for this hospital. There's no going up, uh, there's no going inland. Uh, and so the solutions to a vulnerable hospital like this are different. Um, this is uh, the uh, Nukununu National Hospital that was built uh, by New Zealand Aid in 2013. It was electively rebuilt. It wasn't damaged, it wasn't done because of damage. The solutions that they used was to build a two-story building. The, the concrete, uh, the, there was a large, there's a large storage uh, uh, area that is the foundation uh, of the hospital. Uh, and then there's concrete uh, pillars and framing so that it makes it cyclone proof. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, the reason this design was selected is because this uh, the, this portion of the atoll frequently gets flooding that goes across completely across the atoll. Uh, and so they needed to find a way to protect some of their equipment, be able to continue to provide care, even though there was kind of this low level of flooding. Um, and so all of the valuable, valuable equipment, medical records, patients are housed on the second level of this hospital. Um, in this picture, the new hospital obviously is the gray and pink building. The green building adjacent to it is the old hospital. So this is clearly an upgrade in the quality of the hospital care and well-designed so that this hospital, which serves as a community refuge center, um, can continue functioning no matter what the weather is doing. Um, this is Gizo Hospital uh, in the Solomon Islands. This is the second largest hospital located in the Western portion of the country. Uh, and the building that you see, there's a white building with a tunnel, uh, with a, um, sorry, a, um, a tower next to it. That's the new Gizo Hospital that was built by the Japan, Japan's International Cooperative Agency in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, the estimated cost was about $10 million to build this hospital. This is an outstanding design for a hospital. Number one, it is seismically solid uh, to stand up to any earthquake. The reason this hospital was built, it was in 2007, Gizo suffered a tsunami that followed a significant earthquake. And the original hospital that was built literally right up against the water uh, was damaged. Uh, and so JICA came in and, and agreed to build a new hospital. The design of this hospital, it's a two-story hospital. Um, it has an open center to the hospital. So airflow through the hospital is, is maximized uh, to reduce infection and uh, uh, to keep uh, uh, the hospital cooler. But because of the two stories, moving patients from, from level floor one to floor two was solved with a gradual ramp system that ran around the inside open portion of the hospital. So it didn't matter whether there was power to the hospital or not. The tower that you see here is a water tower. So that when city water uh, is off, um, the hospital can still function with gravity fed water from the tower. And I think that this is really a beautiful example of a hospital that is built with the tropical climate in mind, the limitations of the other utility infrastructure uh, and uh, uh, protecting it from uh, further seismic uh, impacts as well. And this is the National Referral Hospital that's located in Haniara uh, on Guadalcanal and Solomon Islands. 
This is the largest, most vulnerable hospital in the Pacific Islands. It has 380 beds and it serves essentially a catchment of almost 700,000 people, the entire population of Solomon Islands, because this is where all tertiary care is done. Surgeries, complex um, childbirth, et cetera, is done at the National Referral Hospitals, Hospital. It's located 11 meters from the coastline, uh, 140 meters from the Matanikau River, which I've already mentioned can flood when there's heavy rain. Uh, it, is an, it is at an elevation of just under two meters, uh, and it is frequently subjected to evacuations due to storm surge, floods, and tsunami alerts. This is, it, it, th this hospital is probably caught up more in a geopolitical tussle right now um, that's preventing it from being um, uh, relocated in higher ground um, and inland uh, in Solomon Islands. But clearly this is a large hospital, highly vulnerable, uh, and a good example of a hospital that really needs to be prioritized to be moved. So how do you make these hospitals safer? Um, and, and essentially the message from looking at these examples are, is where and how hospitals and health infrastructure are built really matters. Um, the uh, Pan American Health Organization has a smart hospital framework uh, that offers guidance on how to rebuild hospitals in particular uh, to make them safe so they are structurally and non-structurally functionally able to withstand impacts of virtually any natural disaster, extreme weather event, and mitigate the impacts of associated climate change and, var and variability. Um, it all the, the, the PAHO program also includes green hospital facilities, which have a small carbon footprint. They're highly efficient. Uh, they maximize the environment within which they're built. So they have a small environmental footprint, um, but, in, but use sustainability and sound environmental management uh, practices. And then there's the combining the two in what we call a smart hospital, which is both safe as well as green. So this is a hospital that expends very little energy, but can stand up to virtually any natural disaster, continue to perform, and essentially almost function under what I call island operationality, where it functions as its own little city uh, while there's a disaster going on around it. And this is a, I want to show you an example of one of the PAHO um, smart hospitals. This is Peebles Hospital in Tortola, British Virgin Islands. It's a 44 bed hospital with a patient catchment of about, or population catchment of about 24,000 people. It's located at a 55, 155 meters from the coastline, elevation 16 meters. And you might think, well, that's not too bad, you know, 155 meters from the coastline. But this hospital is in what we call Hurricane Alley. Hurricane Alley got its name because on average, 10 hurricanes will pass through this region of the Atlantic and the Caribbean uh, a year. And so the, the government of um, the British Virgin Islands decided, well, we need to remodel our hospital because we really wanted to stand up to a category five hurricane. The expenditure was about $100 million US and they ran into all kinds of budget overruns and whatnot. Uh, that frustrated people, but that investment proved to be worth it. In 2017, people stood up, people's hospitals stood up to two Category 5 hurricanes within one month. And in this picture, you can see that the building is intact while all the buildings around it have been destroyed. The hospital only suffered cracked windows, and it was essentially fully operational and it actually housed people in the community uh, post uh, um, both uh, hurricane storms. And I wanna use one local example is the Ishinomaki Red Cross Hospital uh, that um, 
was uh, uh, hit by your 9.0 uh, earthquake in mm -hmm. 2011 yeah. uh, that then was followed by the tsunami. Fortunately, mm -hmm. this hospital wasn't directly impacted by the tsunami because it was way inland. But the key real point with this hospital is the engineering used a base isolation or what I refer to as a pogo stick uh, to put the building on. Um, the building essentially floats above the basement on a spring-like structure that's made of rubber and steel. So when the earthquake happened, the building moved, but the building bounced, so to speak, and it didn't sway and it didn't crack. Uh, and so the hospital did quite well during the earthquake. I look at this kind of engineering and think if we could find a way to scale this to the economy of Pacific Islands and make it affordable, can we improve the ability of hospitals to stand up to the seismic activity that is endemic to that region. I do want to point out, I noticed uh, in the newspaper that there was an article about um, your prime minister, um, uh, Mr. Kishida. Uh, he actually called for the cabinet to establish uh, hospital ships uh, in response to uh, an earthquake that uh, took place in January. Uh, and I think that this is a smart idea to have that back, that kind of backup so that if a region is hit particularly hard, the hospital ships are dispatched so that people can get their care. The Pacific Islands need something like this. There's no question. Um, I also learned recently about um, one of the hospitals that I had actually studied uh, in Haapia uh, in uh, Tonga. Uh, when the Tonga... Was it the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapia um, submarine volcano erupted uh, and sent a large tsunami uh, throughout the, the Tongan region? Uh, the Hapia uh, hospital actually had been relocated a few years before. It wasn't impacted by the tsunami. Its old location was destroyed, but that hospital because of the decision that was made to build it in higher ground and inland was fully operational through that, through the whole recovery period uh, after the, the tsunami and, and uh, submarine volcanic eruption. So I wanted, one of the things that's really, really important data that we need, uh, in addition to some of the data we've already collected is, is detailed climate data that we can use for modeling in the Pacific Islands. So that we could say that Guadalcanal, the hospital may be located close to the sea, but they're not high risk based on climate modeling for frequent cyclones. It helps us prioritize. It helps the governments prioritize. Uh, it helps any of the adaptation funding to be prioritized to take care of the most vulnerable hospitals first. What this picture shows you is a project that we're working on with the Secretary of the Pacific Community. We have a multidisciplinary group, a bunch of us uh, not so smart doctors and uh, a couple of brilliant climate scientists. Uh, and what we are doing is, is addressing the lack of fidelity uh, in data uh, on um, climate impacts and climate modeling. In the Pacific Islands, fewer than five out of tens of thousands of islands can actually be visualized, visualized in using current climate modeling. Uh, and the gray boxes, the smaller gray boxes, kind of give you an idea of what Pacific Islands look like using current models. What we want is to be able to zero down, to be able to see each individual island and literally model what's going to happen on those islands so governments and development partners can make decisions as to which hospitals, which infrastructure, et cetera, needs to be addressed first. So what we want to see is we want to see the black box. Uh, and that work is being done uh, using uh, AI-driven techniques. Uh, and we hope to have some of the initial uh, data out uh, within the next six months. So what can what can you do? Uh, what can I do as somebody who pushes for meaningful policy in order to advocate for relocating and making Pacific Island hospitals both safe 
and smart. The first is to encourage governments and development partners to prioritize renovating or relocating hospitals before damage occurs because the costs are less when we do it electively. The other thing is because we live in, I live in the United States, you're here in Japan and possibly in other developed countries, our hospitals are really expensive. They're big, they're high tech. We have to stop seeing hospitals as big ticket luxury items. They're not in the Pacific Island. As you saw from some of the examples of hospitals, they're modest structures, but they are clearly in many cases essential for multiple reasons. Um, we have to recognize that hospitals cross two key sectors, health as well as infrastructure. And we need to refer to them as critical infrastructure. Climate change adaptation funding needs to be redefined based on risk and vulnerability. And some of this may have already been addressed in COP28, uh, but the most vulnerable really should be addressed first. And then I think it's really important to bring together public and private partnerships to help work together on Pacific hospitals and clinic upgrades. I don't think this, this can fall to governments and development partners alone. And you know, I really like this WHO um, saying, um, a well-functioning health system working in harmony is built on having trained and motivated healthcare workers, a well-maintained infrastructure highlighted in yellow for a good reason, a reliable supply of medicines and technology, uh, backed by adequate funding, strong health plans, and evidence-based policies. You know, the WHO kind of gets it right here by highlighting that infrastructure is important. The very buildings within which we deliver care to our patients are important. Um, I do want to take an opportunity to just sort of briefly mention uh, the Pacific Healthcare Initiative. Uh, this is a initiative that is going to be introduced uh, in U.S. Congress in September. Uh, Congresswoman Amata Radewagen uh, wrote this initiative after returning from the Solomon Islands and seeing what their hospital was like uh, and basically saying we need to do something to uplift the Pacific Islands and help them build um, uh, better health systems. Uh, the components uh, will include uh, bilateral medical exchanges between U.S. medical universities and Pacific Island health systems in order to lift up the current working the workforce with continuing medical education and, and regular support. Um, it will increase work on increasing the healthcare workforce by establishing linkages between Pacific region medical schools and nursing schools and U.S. Uh, universities. It will assist in the creation of regional Pacific medical centers that provide specialty care locally within the Pacific region for specialty um, uh, uh, diseases like cardiac disease and cancer care. This would avoid sending people overseas to the Philippines or India or Australia where the costs and potentially some of the quality of the care uh, could be um, uh, formidable. Um, the key thing that I really like is that the this this initiative also includes addressing and upgrading vulnerable and crumbling Pacific Island health facility infrastructure. And then the last thing I think is the most key component, and that is coordinate all health system strengthening programs with other developing partners working in the Pacific. That means bringing everybody to the table together, reducing redundancy of our efforts, reducing costs and increasing uh, output. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm uh, uncertain what the political situation is gonna be in the United States, it's a presidential election this year, but uh, the Congresswoman is going to be introducing this and uh, I'm hopeful uh, that we will at least get a portion of this to be funded. So I want to finish this. This is a stamp uh, from the Solomon Islands. Um, and I want to finish just by making some final comments. Um, Pacific Island hospitals uh, serve many purposes. 
hospitals care for some of the most vulnerable people in communities, but they also offer shelter to families and the communities within which they are. The people who leave their homes during storms and strife, but they can also present some of the most difficult challenges once they're damaged and compromised. And I think that our examples in particular in New Orleans uh, during uh, Hurricane Katrina are a very good example of that. So the de developing smart and safe hospitals in the Pacific region will minimize this. Uh, and so we have to begin to prioritize hospitals within the Pacific Islands as critical infrastructure, seeing it as adaptation because the impacts are already locked in in the Pacific Island, uh, Pacific Island countries. Um, and we have to say that hospitals being critical infrastructure are just as important as the roads and the bridges and the ports and the airports that you access them through. So I thank you very, very much for allowing me to um, give this presentation and I hope um, found it interesting and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so thank you. much. Uh, actually, there's the uh, one question from the audience. Let me start with his question by Rick. He said, thank you for excellent talk. A proposed Pacific Island Hospital being designed to withstand storms that exceed historical maximum intensities. And then maybe I want to add one more element, which is you know, what elements are needed to build the hospitals and clinic in Pacific Island that stands up extreme weather events and things. I think, you know, the, the extreme weather events um, are compounded by um, natural disasters. I mean, the Pacific is in, Pacific Islands are in the ring of fire. Uh, and I think that what you see here in Japan is actually very similar to what uh, Pacific, many Pacific Island countries uh, have to deal with. Clearly how the hospitals are built um, makes a difference. And I think the hospital uh, that I used as an example, Gizo Hospital that was built, built by Japan um, is a good example. It is not on a pogo stick uh, like the Red Cross Hospital is, but it is built so that it can withstand a cyclone, at least a, a, a category five cyclone. So how they're built, scaling that to what the economies of countries can handle and the size of the hospitals. Again, these hospitals aren't super large hospitals. Um, the materials that are used uh, one example, um, uh, there was a hospital that was built and the uh, construction folks said, well, we're going to use crushed coral. You have plenty of coral around here. They crushed the coral, but they didn't dry it out. So when it was laid in place around the rebar, the rebar actually rusted very quickly because it had moist coral pressing up against it. So nice attempt at working with what the environment gives you, but the coral probably should have been dried out a little bit more. So it's really sort of working with the elements, uh, reducing its footprint, the you know using uh, cement uh, um, framing, so to speak, uh, can make these hospitals much stronger. And then, again, I think where you build them, if you have the option to be inland, uh, like in Apia, where they relocated inland and did quite well after the the uh, submarine volcanic eruption um, makes a tremendous difference. Thank you. So there are any questions coming up? Um, <laughs> let's see. Okay, let me um, point with Yoshio matsuki -san. He asked a narrow question. Have you heard, observed, any increase of human wild animal contact in Solomon Islands, for example, bats? Any <laughs> so uh, any wild animal contact? Bats, for example. Bats? Uh, bats are, I mean, there are a tremendous number of bats in the Solomon Islands. You see them all the time. There's all kinds of snakes. Um, I mean, the <laughs> interface between humans, and you're probably yeah. thinking about like the concept of one health, uh, the interface between humans and, and animals in most of the Pacific Islands 
and in particular Solomon Islands, which has a heavy sort of a jungle-like uh, center to the island, right. is pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Have I heard of any diseases being transmitted other than um, having livestock living in your village and walking around uh, with everybody else uh, causing some infections? Um, I have not heard of any kind of any, you know, big One Health uh, infectious disease breakthroughs. Okay, so another question from Rick. Um, for uh, for low islands, are preparations being made for bombment in the case that sea level and storm surges rise to the level that inhabitation becomes unsafe? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I actually just attended a, a series of talks uh, about Pacific Islands and uh, Fiji uh, has been very aggressive in uh, and you know, not only adaptation uh, and, uh, you know, working on trying to keep people in their native land, but they are starting to relocate people. So there are relocation programs uh, being put in place. Um, it isn't happening very often, but the fact that the plans are being established so that they can sort of pull the trigger, so to speak, to move a whole village, um, uh, it simplifies the process as as sea level rise goes up. Mm. Okay, so another question for me is, you mentioned in your talk that hospitals are seen as a luxury items by development partners and governments. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that seeing them as luxury items is our own personal bias. Um, I'm sure, you know, Tokyo has some very large hospitals. Uh, I worked in, you know, UCSF and a number of large hospitals in the United States. Uh, these, and even the repairs that needed to be done at New York University Langone after Superstorm Sandy, that cost $2 billion to repair that building, just repair that building. The cost of building our current high-tech hospitals today is in the billions. So that is a luxury item. You could rebuild almost every hospital in the Pacific Islands on $1 billion or probably less than a billion dollars. And so I think we, you know, one of the reasons why I include what the cost of relocating a hospital is in some of my examples is they cost between 2 million and maybe $23 million to be relocated. That's not a luxury item to me. That is a that's actually kind of an affordable deal relative to what we have. So they're not high-tech hospitals, but they are essential. And how they're built needs to be uh, addressed so that they're not a short-term solution, that they are there, you know, for the duration. Great. So um, I really hope that the Congress would pass that <laughs> bill to actually, you know, build hospitals in yes. this uh, region and uh, costing the money. So some health policy advocates say money is better spent on prevention and disease management. What do you say to that? Yeah, we talked about this over the last few <laughs> days as well, too. I tend to, and maybe it's because I was a surgeon, um, but I do have a master's in public health. I, I t believe in prevention, but no prevention is 100%, and yeah. prevention doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It has to include educating children all the way up to adults, changing behaviors, the way we eat, et cetera. Um, so there are going to be people who get sick. Uh, and I advocate for, I mean, how, how, do, how do we turn around and say, sorry, we didn't prevent your diabetes, so we're not going to treat it. So we do need to be able to treat those people who have secondary and tertiary um, challenges. Uh, and what we should be doing is striving for preventing as much as possible, but there has to be expenditure. And if you look at diseases that people in the, in the Pacific Islands are dying from, it's not communicable diseases anymore. It's not TB, it's not malaria. It, diabetes. It is cancer. And when you look at how they're doing in providing care for those, treatments for those, and even prevention for those, they're not doing well. 
within the sort of analysis. We and we recently analyzed uh, universal health data, universal health coverage data in the Pacific Islands. The NCD columns were in the red. You know, doing vaccinations, blue, doing well. It's where we put our emphasis. And I'm not saying we should take the emphasis away from prevention. I just think we need to layer in some care as well, too. How do you tell a 34-year-old guy that has colon cancer you're not going to get an operation? That's that's part of the problem. I mean, what young people, people dying prematurely affects the workforce. It, economically, it affects the country because for every dollar invested in health care, the return is $2, 2 to $4. And so I think we have to sort of incorporate that. I'm not saying replace it because I do, do believe in prevention, but I think we also, we can't turn a blind eye to people who actually get diseases. Great. And next question. Um, you talked about the disaster fund on the COP and those uh, global communities, you know, effort to save uh, those climate change affected uh, regions. And what do you think, obviously the U.S. is passing this bill, but what do you think the U.S. region can do more to, you know, to these challenges that we face? Yeah, I think, um, you know, loss and damage, um, I think what is it have is maybe $660 million right now. Um, adaptation fund, you know, there's clearly an adaptation gap. There's no question. Um, I know that there's some, some sticking points about the World Bank managing the fund. They think it's too expensive. World Bank isn't very good on climate change. You know, there were, have been a couple of things, reasons raised. But I actually think maybe we need to think outside the box on this one. Maybe what we should be incorporating into these funds is in-kind donations so that you're not co-mingling money because the U.S. doesn't like to co-mingle its money. Uh, and the U.S. hasn't put a tremendous amount of money into the fund. But what if Japan says, we'll rebuild this hospital and this hospital as an in-kind? You know how to work within what your budget is going to be. And if the risk has been reduced to so that loss and damage is reduced, maybe we need to rethink how we, we allocate loss and damage. Maybe it isn't just giving money into a pot. Maybe it's also countries committing to you know, reducing vulnerability. That's just kind of my own way of sort of thinking about things because those of us that work in, in global health and health capacity building, we use that all the time. It may not be a nice pot of money for us to do our work, but we get in-kind donations and that moves the needle heavily. That's a great idea. And my final question before Dr. Kurokawa <laughs> is Japan, as you know, we have so that, many- That is a very- difficult issues because I think we live in a hyper-connected world, mm. so we know what's happening, but I think each, everybody has a, your own nation. Yeah. Right? And you, uh, how to help each other is a thing, but can you really do it? Yeah. Because democracy or this or that, since they're killing each other, what's happening in, in that, in the Eastern Europe, you know, that's again, mm. killing each other. Right. Why is that? That's humans. Yeah. They die and they they have to educate the next generation again. Yeah. So I think, it's, so that is a human being. Mm -hmm. What to do? Why is the nation? Why is they killing each other now? Yeah. We never become wise. That is the issue. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> that we never become wiser? No, no, not really. You have to start from scratch again. Yeah. That's my argument. I mean, it, I, you know, I work, the organization I work in is a multinational organization. Sure, I'm right. the only American. So they yeah. always refer to I me know. as the young. Right. But there's a way that we can work together. Yeah. Um, I think we have to find the right people to sort of bring, yeah. bring us together. So the right leaders. 
right. uh, that are willing to do that. The right projects, making everybody feel comfortable with the project, right. allowing every, and I think it's okay uh, if we're working together for, and we're working towards a common goal so, for countries to fly their flag and say, we well, built this and we did it. That's fine. I have no problem with that. I just think we need to have structure because right. there's a lot of wasted spending so, on global health right. projects, in particular when we have siloed treatments of diseases so, as opposed to strengthening the foundation of a healthcare system. Right. Um, so can we get there? Sure. That, that's an that's a issue of democracy. You have to have a majority who support it. Yeah. Well, look at this, uh, Bill Gates. He really started supporting this African thing. Mm -hmm. I was a part of this thing. And that kind of thing. Such a wealthy people, millions of things, what they want to do. Yeah. Right? Well, and I think that, you know, Bill Gates and, and um, you know, Microsoft and different, sure, sure. different businesses, sure. bringing right. them in as public-private partnership sure. where government is yeah. working with I, industry. I, I, um, can really sort of stretch our dollars more uh, and get more bang for our buck, right. so to speak. Right? Yep. Yep. But I think convincing your government is also very difficult in democratic country. Oh, tell me about it. What you think? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing, I've been traveling to Washington, D.C. for 15 years sure. talking to people. But you have to like, educate and first way, at least maybe 40% of the population. That's right. That's right. And they, we have a, we truly have a blind spot in the United States about the Pacific Islands, a real right. blind spot. In fact, I would probably say 30% of Americans, 40% of Americans don't so, even know where the Pacific Islands are. Right. They might know something about World War II, but right. um, not like, very much. Is there, <laughs> just a few places, and a nice, nice, tiny medical center, but the way the doctors and nurses, all the things, the way the budget and continuing this and that, that is a very difficult. Mm -hmm. And then we, we are not seeing this in the unconnected world. Yeah. You know, so, so everything is now built by greater public in this and that. Mm -hmm. And but every decision in democratic country takes some one side of convincing yeah. citizens, right? Yeah. And everybody will die and have to educate from scratch from baby again. And they're repeating the same thing. Why is that? That I I really think that's what it is. Homo sapiens is the most <laughs> educated and smart people in our planet, it looks like. Yeah. But what they do. I have no idea. That that maybe become big, become sort of pessimistic or this or that. Yeah. And we can see this thing from an island or thing and Africa. Um, <laughs> we repeating the same thing. We don't become wiser. That's my issue yep. all the time. My own <laughs> opinion is when it comes to global health, when it comes so, to, to right. uh, building uh, health capacity is we haven't taken the right approach. Yeah, It doesn't make sense to treat specific diseases right. and ignore everything else. And so what I say is let's do something different. Let's just go <laughs> ahead and strengthen the entire healthcare system. Let's just work from the bottom up. Right. Because in the United States or in Japan, if you were to get tuberculosis, right. would you go to a tuberculosis clinic or would you go to your doctor first right. you get that chest x-ray yeah. done you go to see yeah. a pulmonologist right. sure. why are we treating countries in sub-saharan africa and pacific islands differently right why shouldn't all their doctors be able right. to see you and determine you have right. tb and to treat you right so i think that we we've sort of created silos right expensive silos yeah. Uh, and we haven't been very efficient uh, yeah. in sort of building up the entire health system. And that, I think, is why Congresswoman Redwagon wants to pass, get right. this initiative going. Sure. Uh, is She had a chance to literally talk right. to doctors and nurses in the Solomon Islands about their challenges. Sure. And I think it just takes a, we need to think about it differently. Right. Will it work? 
No, no, I, I know that because in 1970s, I was in the US and as a medical doctor, and all of a sudden I see few people are running. Why they do it? Because they eat too much and they just read writing. That's crazy. In my view, that's and around that time, 1970s, big obesity was not a big issue. Yeah. And and some start running. Why they run? This just skipping this lunch. Mm -hmm. That I thought I thought that's a bit crazy. And now you are jogging then. Yep. And keep eating. So I, I don't want to do that. So I eat only once a day meat. That's a more reasonable thing. Yep. So that that I'm really wondering what is the wisdom of the humans on this planet that <laughs> I guess, good question. <laughs> I guess we can leave up to the air. It's an open question. <laughs> so thank you so much for your sure. valuable uh, discussion and also the information that from the Pacific Island. I like to so, think. And so. do you want to, do you want to have a last point? I'm really care about the future of this planet. Yeah. Because humans are destroying it. And they're supposed to be smart, but not really. That's my view. Why diabetes? That's a rare disease. Yeah. Hypertension, that was a rare disease. And sure. all your lifestyle. They're not rare diseases in the Pacific, though. That's the tragedy. No, that, yeah, right. Yeah. I know. That's a human, somehow. Yeah. And we know that. But we are so selfish. Yeah. So I think I really uh, liked Bill Gates when we started this year, some and mm -hmm. he hit him, and he and the Japanese government and a few uh, uh, farmer put money together. And I went to Africa, all the things, and do something new. Mm -hmm. That was good. Okay. Right. I That's guess. Uh, my <laughs> so <laughs> this. feel free to share my email address sure, with sure. the students. And yes. if anybody has any comments, suggestions, sure. corrections, I'm happy to receive right. emails. Thank so you. democracy, very difficult to <laughs> execute. <laughs> with that, uh, we'd like to close today's session. And then thank you very much for everybody who joined this session. And then we're going to be sharing uh, our uh, gratitude to Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I really, I really am honored to have thank been here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank that's you. Great. Thank you. Because I've been to this small island, and that's very nice. And they are lazy, 